Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to UECG Metro East English Service. May I invite each one of you to prepare our hearts and minds as we come before the Lord in the comforts of our homes. And may the presence of the Lord be in our midst. Let us read 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 23 to 29 as we begin and worship our God. Sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Oh 
singing aloud my hope alive in you. I'll walk through the fire and not be burned, pray in the fight and watch it turn. Jesus, my Lord, I give it all to you. I won't let the storm weather my heart, won't let the darkness beat me down. Singing aloud my hope alive in you. I'll walk through the fire and not be burned, pray in the fire and watch it turn. Jesus, my Lord, I give it all to you.
his keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle worker, promise me. Soul is anchored with you. 
forever sing, forever sing, forever sing. You are never far away, always reaching out to save my weakness. Covered by your strength And I am found forever safe You are never far away Always reaching out to save My weakness covered by your strength Let us pray. O Lord our God, you are worthy of all our praises. You are the God who never fails to keep his promises. You are the God who lifts all those who are weary, and you are the God who meets the needs of your children. We just want to thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, and we want to praise your holy name. We will never forget all your blessings and how you have redeemed us from our sins and satisfied us every day. We ask for your forgiveness, Father, for the sins that we have committed. Help us, Lord, to hate our sin more and love you more by obeying you. Please help us, Lord, worship you with an undistracted heart. You know how our mind wanders to our upcoming week or our present worries or any thoughts of other things. Help us put those thoughts away and focus on you and your glory. We pray for our internet connection, Lord, that there will be no problem as we listen upon your word, Lord, reveal to us the wonders of your word through our speaker and convict us of any sins. May we be encouraged, Lord, to learn and apply the preaching this morning. Let your Holy Spirit dwell in our hearts and equip us, challenge us, Lord, comfort us, teach us inspire us as we learn more about your ways all these things we ask through christ our lord amen our passage for this morning is found in the book of esther chapter 4. let us open our bible and read together the word of god with reference verse 1 when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. Verses 7 to 8 Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther 
and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Verses 11 to 16 All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law. That they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. The title of our message for today is Perish, Prayer, and Providence. Let us welcome our speaker, Reverend Elson Blau. A blessed Sunday to all of you. I praise the Lord that all of us are safe and are all experiencing the provision, protection of our Almighty Father in Heaven. Whether we know it or not, we are actually experiencing the providential hand of God at work in our lives every day. And as we are going through our series on the book of Esther, it is worth noting that not only God's name and the Word of God not mentioned, but prayer is also not mentioned at all. And yet, though these three are not mentioned, God and His Word are actually actively at work, and His people were actually praying. Look at Esther chapter 4, verse 15. It says, Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days or night, and I and my maiden also will fast in the same way. Esther does not mention prayer, but she and her maidens devoted themselves to fasting and praying. And she also asked Mordecai and all the Jews in Susa, the capital of Persia, to actually fast and pray. The seemingly insurmountable, life-threatening problem that they were facing brought them to their knees, mourning, fasting, and praying. All the Jews were also doing the same. They were all facing a frightening death threat. We could say that it was more fearful than the pandemic that we are facing right now. Today, as we are going through this pandemic that has brought about global economic crisis, and financial experts says it can be worse than the 2008 global crisis, and all the unforeseen crisis that lurks around the corner, there is something that we need to do about it. And we can learn from the book of Esther on the topic of praying and the providence of God. Here's the first principle we could learn from Esther. Number one, pray at all times and never lose heart. Pray at all times and never lose heart. Jesus Christ in Luke 18, 1 said, Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. You know, this parable that Jesus shared was about a woman who was pleading for justice from a city judge. It is very interesting that Mordecai, Esther, and the Jews were also facing a great injustice and they were seeking justice from God. Now, whether Esther or Mordecai were praying regularly or not, 
What is important is to hear what Jesus wants us to do. And here's what he says about prayer. He says, do not just pray in times of trouble, but rather pray at all times. Why pray at all times? Because prayer strengthens right relationship with God. Prayer strengthens right relationship with God. Prayer is not a requesting relationship, but a right relationship with God. Let me say that again. Prayer is not requesting only asking God, asking God, but a right relationship with God. We should not relate to God like a cosmic grandfather where we have the notion that when you wish upon a star, it makes no difference who you are. Anything your heart desires will come to you. Or relate to God like a genie where you need to rub Aladdin's lamp in the right spot and it is built a belief that if you rub God the right way, He will do whatever you ask of Him. That's not what it is. Or sometimes we could relate to God like 911, that we make God like an emergency. We, when we have emergency, we call God. And God becomes like a spare tire when one area of our life goes flat. We should never treat God that way. Prayer is never that way. When prayer is the first resort instead of the last resort, we will be spared from so much trouble. Remember prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, which is what our Lord wants us to really learn. It starts with our Father who is in heaven. You see, prayer first and foremost is having a right relationship with God and the more we pray the more we strengthen that right relationship and the more we have this we are rightly relating with God as our father the more we will pray to him recently we just celebrated Father's Day which is once a year only and I received this from a person he said there is a boy talking to another boy and this boy said are you related to anyone famous and this another boy said I don't want to brag but I heard dad calling God his father I heard dad calling God his father I pray that we will celebrate our Heavenly Father's Day every day by praying to him every day every day by communing with him and listening to his word as in God is speaking to us through his word and that is what it is God really wants to speak to us through his word every day because he is the one who truly cares and who truly loves us and he wants to guide us 24 7 we need to pray at all times because prayer strengthens a right relationship with God and also because Prayer strengthens us not to lose heart. You see, Mordecai, Esther, and all the Jews who were about to be butchered were greatly mourning. And it would be easy to think, and if anyone were in their situation, probably we could also lose heart. But you know what? God wants us not to lose heart. You see, if you will be butchered, you have a death sentence and there was nowhere to go. And that's exactly what happened to Esther and Mordecai and the Jews. There was nowhere to run. It was an edict and it was signed. It was with the king's approval. Of course, what would you feel? But you know what? We do not have to lose heart. But how can we not lose heart? Believe it or not, prayer actually is what will help in a major way so that we will not lose heart how because prayer turns our focus from the problem to focus on god and when we keep on focusing on the pressing and oppressing problems it will become so big that we would surely start to lose heart it is like looking into a microscope and you will become scared more and more. Just like looking at tiny germs that become so scary when you look at them through a microscope. 
And that is actually what many people are doing unconsciously. They magnify their problems. No wonder why many people are distressed and depressed. But you know what? When we start to focus on God, just shift our focus toward God, we will see how great and almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing our great God is. And our problems will become smaller, smaller compared to our great almighty God. We will see God for who He really is. Just like the song that we just sang this morning, we will see God as the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. And you know what? You would call Him my God. Not anymore God, but my God. My God, you will embrace Him. And you know that He's there for you as your Father. And you could say, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. Corey Ten Boom once said, If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you will be depressed. But if you look at God, you will be at rest. At rest. Remember, we should pray not only when we are in trouble, but we need to pray at all times so that the habit is already there. When you are not praying at all times and you only pray when, it, when trouble comes, you don't know how to pray. You wouldn't know how to call on God because you are not used to this. Now, one of the reasons why many people do not continue on praying or do not persevere in praying is because they often do not experience an answer to prayer. They start to think that prayer does not change anything. And you know what? The devil will quickly whisper to our ears, telling us that it is useless to pray, that there is no power in praying, and that is a big lie. Prayer really does change things. It changes, yes, it changes many things. Yes, it does not change the eternal plan of God or God Himself. It does not change God at all, but it actually changes our situation. It changes our problems and it changes us. It changes us. And this leads us to the second main point. Not only pray at all times, but secondly, pray at all costs for God's will. Pray at all costs for God's will. We need to pray at all times and pray at all costs for God's will and not our will be done. Mordecai told Esther, that she needs to bring their life-threatening concern to King Xerxes. Esther, even though she's the queen, cannot do anything. She knows, and she said to Mordecai, if I go to the king without being called, I will perish, I will die. And she reminded Mordecai that there is but one law to be put to death, except the one who holds the king, I mean, the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. Notice that Esther says this, but as for me, as for me. Oftentimes it is so easy to think of, but as for me. Many years ago when I listened carefully to my own prayers, I realized that I'm so much focused on as for me, as for my petition, as for my protection, my provision, my portion, my life. Now, I'm not saying that this is how Esther prayed. But isn't it so easy to be focused on what we want than on what God wants? Our will than on God's will? Now, look what Mordecai said. Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. Mordecai said frankly to Esther, if you do not go to the king, you will also die, as we will also die. Mordecai's words were designed to convince Esther that her thought of safety within the palace, it's a myth. It's not a reality. Mordecai is saying, there is really no safe place, not even inside the palace. Now let us carefully look what Esther said. She said, 
except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. Now let me ask you a question. Who is it that ultimately holds the golden scepter of approval and the final say of our lives? Is it really the kings or the presidents? Never and it never was and it never will be. You see, ultimately it is God who with his eternal providence is in control of all things and all of life including every breath we take. Though we have talked about the providence of God, I realize that we need to understand this in a deeper way. So let me put a definition of what divine providence is. Divine providence is the governance of God by which he is in complete control of the whole universe with his perfect wisdom, perfect power, and perfect love. He cares for and directs all things and all of life, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand in the whole universe. Now, let me say that again. Divine providence is the governance of God by which he is in complete control in the whole universe with his perfect wisdom, perfect power, and perfect love. He cares for and directs all things and all of life, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Now, remember Corey Ten Boom, who went through a very horrifying incident when she and her family were under the Nazi regime. They were eventually imprisoned in the concentration camp. And yet, listen to what she said. She said, the safest place on earth is to be in the center of God's will. The safest place on earth is to be in the center of God's will. Not what we think is safe, but what God's will is. And this is indeed true. When you know deep in your heart that you are living and doing according to God's will, you will be saved whether in life or in death. Because you will be the, in the hands of God. Forever safe. And we will not be afraid even of death. Yes, we truly need to be in the center of God's will. But how can we have the strength and determination to be in the center of God's will or to do God's will? Now look what Esther said. When she was reminded, and though she knows this very well, she replied, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa. Hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. What she's saying is, yes, let's do this. Let's do the will of God. Let's do this by you praying for me and I will also be praying. We need to pray. We need to pray for each other. Why pray? Because prayer is strengthens us to seek and obey God's will. When, a, when Esther said to Mordecai that she would present herself to King Xerxes, even if it is against the law of the Persians, that it could cost her very dear life, do you think she was not afraid? Of course she was. In fact, in the Hebrew word, there was a word there that mentioned that she was afraid when she saw when she heard that Mordecai was praying and fasting, the word in Hebrew there for afraid was not just afraid, no, but debilitating fear. It was a fear that made, him sh made her shake. She was so afraid. She, she, we know that as a woman, she was very afraid of what's going to happen. And even men would be afraid when death is in just in the corner. I bet she was struggling in thinking if she can actually do it or even find the courage to come before the presence of the king. No, so what finally made her find the courage to come before King Xerxes and find success? It was because she first came before the presence of the king of kings. That's it. Coming first before God. And I encourage all of us to do that, whatever concerns we're going through. Before we come up with whatever we think is right, come before God first. 
and you would see a big difference. God will give you wisdom and you would find that peace that surpasses all understanding. In one of the messages of Ravi Sakarias when he was in the Philippines and I heard him speak, he said that one of the gifts that his wife gave him that he is so thankful for was a kneeling altar. A kneeling altar where there is a, where he could kneel down and there's a top portion where he could put his Bible. It is where he regularly finds strength and wisdom as he seeks the presence of God in prayer and in seeking the Word of God. When Ravi Sakarias was very sick and he was very weak already, he said to those closest to him, it would be nice if I could kneel down one last time before my God. What a longing for God. And you know what Ravi Sakarias said when he was still very strong many years ago? He said, the day you believe that your prayer life is the most critical part of your spiritual life, your life will be dramatically changed. Yes, that is very true. Ravi had a sense of peace and safety, even in the brink of death, because he has been seeking to walk according to God's will. And it is in coming before the presence of God that he finds the strength and wisdom to continue to walk according to God's will. Esther said, If I perish, I perish. But come to think of it, aren't we all perishing? We will all perish. And it is really just a matter of when. But the real issue is, how are we living in the here and now? Because it is not how long we live, but how well we live our lives. I believe all of us want to have a life well lived. But let me tell you this. If we do not live according to God's will, we will not really have a life well lived. Yes, we will go to heaven if we are true Christians. But please know this, that a life not lived according to God's will could end in regrets in hell or regrets in heaven. Let me say it again. A life not lived according to God's will could end in regrets in hell or regrets in heaven. Look at Revelation chapter 21 verse 4. It says, And he shall wipe every tear from their eyes, and there shall no longer be any death. Now look at this. If there are no tears in heaven, what will God wipe? The reason why it says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, because there will be tears in heaven, but only at the start of it. Because God will wipe it, and there will be no more crying. But some of those tears will be tears of regret. Tears of great regrets. According to Charles Spurgeon, who is a well-known theologian and preacher, he said, if there could be regrets in heaven, those regrets would be that we have wasted so many opportunities of honoring Christ on earth. Opportunities which will then be gone forever. Remember, a life well lived is a life well surrendered. Please don't miss this. A life well lived is a life well surrendered to God. Because if we do not learn to surrender to God, we will always be in conflict with God. We will not follow God and we will end up fighting with God. And that will be one of our biggest mistakes. We need to pray at all costs because prayer strengthens us to seek and obey God's will. And secondly, because prayer strengthens our knowledge and experience of God. It is very interesting and exciting that Esther, who actually took time to pray and to fast, experienced the invisible mighty hand of God working to guide her and give her wisdom in what she ought to do. And when we could see that, it was really God who guided her. For how could she be so successful in what she was doing? How could the frightening death situation turn for their good? The only reason is because God's providential hand 
was in complete control in every detail of what happened. From guiding Esther to do how to approach King Xerxes to inviting the king to a banquet with Haman. Just imagine how could Esther have thought of all these brilliant ideas so wisely and so well. It was because she took time to seek God in prayer for wisdom, for guidance, and she surrendered to the wise counsel and the wise will of the Father. And God's providential care and guidance led them all the way. All the way. According to R.C. Sproul, a well-known theologian, he said, prayer is one of the most effective means we have to discern the invisible hand of the providence. The more we understand the character of God, the easier it is for us to see His hand at work in our lives. This comes first from the self-revelation God gives in Scripture, but also mightily in the experience of prayer. There was a billionaire who was interviewed on how he was so successful in his many businesses. He said that every day he kneels down to pray. The interviewer who was not a Christian was surprised with that answer and said to him, What do you mean? You are not seriously saying that you are actually praying, right? The billionaire said, of course, I mean it. I really pray every day. How do you think I got all the ideas that I had for running the business? It is my prayer, brothers and sisters, that as we go through this, seven, this week of fasting and praying, we would really seek God and we would really do whatever it takes to follow God's will. And when we do that, we will live a life well lived because a life well lived is a life well surrendered. Surrendered to God's sovereign providence. Now, some of you might be asking, if God is provident and sovereign, why do we still need, have, still need to pray? Now, let me answer that question by, go, by looking back into our main points. Number one, pray at all times. Because prayer strengthens a right relationship with God. And prayer strengthens us not to lose heart. Secondly, pray at all costs. Because prayer strengthens us to obey God and His will. And prayer strengthens our knowledge and experience of God. Do you notice something? Prayer is not for God's sake. It was never for God's sake. God does not need our prayer at all. Prayer is for our sake. It is us who needs to pray. It is us who needs God and God doesn't need us. And God wants us to truly pray because He wants to bless us. He wants to guide us. He wants us to experience life at its highest and best. And so I pray we would really pray at all times and pray at all costs. In application, I encourage all of us to join the prayer and fasting this week with a humble heart that truly seek to do what God wills you to be and what God wills you to do. The evangelist, Reverend Smith, when he was asked what the secret of revival was, he said this, Go home. Take a piece of chalk and draw a circle around yourself. Then pray, O oh Lord, revive everything inside this circle. I pray that during this week, you and I would truly experience revival in our hearts. Because revival starts with one person at a time. And I pray that our whole church and many churches around this world would experience true revival. Secondly, Start to have a regular prayer time every day and commit to pray at all times and at all costs. E. M. Bounds, the man who keeps on praying, said this, What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. It is my prayer that each one of us 
would truly become men and women mighty in prayer. In June of 2013, a news broadcast across the country featured a little boy, three-year-old boy. His name is Grayson Clamp. You see, Grayson Clamp was born with problem with his auditory nerves, so he could not hear any voice at all. And attempts were made to restore his hearing, his hearing, but the doctors were unsuccessful until there was a procedure that they tried connecting the auditory nerve directly to the brain of Grayson. Now this procedure proved successful. And you know what's interesting? Millions of people enjoyed seeing the look of wonder and joy on the little boy's face when he finally heard his father's voice for the very first time. And what a joy it was for him to hear his father's voice. It is my prayer that all of us would also long to really hear our Heavenly Father's voice. We hear very well, but do we hear clearly? And do we long to hear our Heavenly Father's voice? It is my prayer that during this prayer and fasting, we would really be able to hear and we could really say from our hearts, Our Father who art in heaven, the Lord bless you. work for our good though sometimes we can't see how they could struggles that break our hearts into sometimes blind us to the truth our father knows what's best for ways are not our own so when your pathway grows dim and you just can't see him remember he's still on the throne God is too wise to be mistaken God is too good to be unkind so when you don't understand when you don't see his plan when you can't trace his hand trust his heart he sees the master plan he holds a few those who have no hope all our hope is found in Him we see the present clearly but He sees the first and last and like a tapestry He's weaving you God is 
is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you don't see His plan, when you can't trace His hand, trust His heart. When you don't understand, and sisters, as we now partake of the communion, I encourage us to remember that the cross has changed everything. It has changed our past. It has changed our present. It has changed our future. For in the past, we were hopeless. We were all in the darkness, no hope. But now, we could live in victory because of Christ Jesus and because God has given us so much grace and mercy. And in the future, we are promised of eternal life eternal heaven to be with God forever look at what the Word of God says it says for whenever you eat this bread and drinks this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes therefore whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body of and blood of the Lord a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. As we celebrate the Lord's Day, as we partake of this Holy Communion, let us come before God, recognizing the body of the Lord, that we will not desecrate it, but we come with fear and reverence. So let us come and ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. If there be any sin in our lives, let us ask God to cleanse us. Let us take a moment of silence. Lord, thank you for your promise that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, make us worthy to partake of this holy communion. In Jesus' name, Amen. I'd like to encourage all of us to please stand up. And now take the bread that you have prepared or the cracker that you have prepared. Let's come before God. That's the most important thing. And when Jesus had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us all pray. Continue to stand, please. Now take the cup that you have your juice. 
In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory, both now and forevermore. Amen.